Hello, everybody. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Renu Malhotra. Um, she is a Regents Professor of Planetary Science at the University of Arizona, which means she's extremely fancy. Um, she did her PhD at Cornell um, and postdoc at Caltech. Um, she is an expert in all things um, planetary dynamics, which is why she was elected to the National Academy of Sciences. Um, and I'm very excited to hear about Pluto near the edge of strong chaos. Everyone, please welcome Renu. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. Can you hear me? Is this mic in a good place? Yes, no? It's not loud. How's this? Is that better? Okay. All right. So I chose this topic because, um, well, for one, it's a topic that, I, that I've worked on off and on for the last, for most of my career. Um, it's also a topic which uh, has many unsolved problems, and it has a lot of technical challenges. And I hope to maybe excite the curiosity of some people in the audience about uh, thinking, of, thinking harder about solving some of the unsolved problems here. Um, so let's see, here's an outline of my talk. Um, I guess I, I did have a pointer, okay. Uh, I'm, first, I'm going to give you a background, and probably I'll, I'll end up spending too much time on the background. Uh, the background, in short, is going to be that uh, Pluto's orbit has been known to be weakly chaotic, but it's practically stable on giga year time scales. Giga years, the solar system, just to remind you, is four and a half giga years old. Uh, Pluto's role, uh, Pluto has had a strong role in revealing the orbital migration history of the giant planets in the solar system through its orbital resonance with Neptune. And uh, part of, uh, the, amongst the puzzles that remains is Pluto's inclination is only partly understood, only partially understood through mechanisms that we, we know of. Um, the, and then the new results that I'm gonna to talk to you about are understanding the role of Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus on Pluto's long-term dynamics. And it turns out, and this, we can even end the lecture at this point, um, it turns out that there's a fortuitous orbital arrangement of Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus, which defines a rather narrow zone of, um, of a parameter where Pluto-like orbits are stable. And uh, this, this narrow zone is bounded by, 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 parts of, by parts of parameter space where Pluto-like orbits are gonna be very strongly chaotic. This is uh, uh, just published in this uh, PNAS paper. It's in press, and I think I just signed off right now on the article charges, so it's, uh, it's actually been published online. The archive preprint came out this morning. Okay, so uh, something like uh, in the early 1990s, there were nine planets in the solar system. Uh, the ninth, Pluto, didn't quite fit in. As you can see here, uh, its orbit is very tipped, very, very inclined to the uh, nearly common plane of the other planets. It's also very elliptical compared to the nearly circular orbits of the planets. Pluto's orbit has a very high ellipticity. It's also very, uh, as I mentioned, it's tilted. And in the neighborhood, of, in the different neighborhoods of the solar system, Pluto really sticks out like this. So this is a sideways view of the solar system taking uh, the, di the distance from the sun on this axis and up and down distance relative to the mid plane of the solar system. And these are the different neighborhoods. Um, so Pluto's orbit makes this kind of loop up and down uh, relative to the mid plane. And so it really kind of sticks out of the solar system. Um, okay, so we are here, right? Very close to the sun right there, one astronomical unit. For scale, Pluto is on average, it's about 40 astronomical units away from the sun. At perihelion, it's inside, uh, it's somewhat inside Neptune's orbit distance. And at aphelion, it, it goes out almost twice as far away. So its orbit is very, very elliptical and very inclined. Here's another way of uh, thinking about it. Pluto's orbit is uh, eccentric. Here, this is a projection looking down on the plane of the solar system, so Pluto's orbit intersects or overlaps uh, Neptune's orbit. And here's a sideways view showing that the uh, orbit planes are really um, 
uh, dis disparate. Now, Pluto is not in any danger of actually colliding with uh, Neptune, even though its orbit overlaps that of Neptune. This you can see in this animation where we go into a rotating frame, a frame that's rotating with Neptune's orbit around the sun. So Neptune is this little guy making just a tiny little wiggle here uh, because of its tiny eccentricity, but otherwise it's practically stationary in this rotation, rotating frame. And Pluto is doing this kind of loop relative to that rotating frame, in that rotating frame. So you can see at perihelion, these are these perihelion loops. And uh, at perihelion, it's, uh, its longitude is well away from that of uh, Neptune. And this is because of this, uh, uh, an orbital resonance. Its orbital period is very, very, very close to a three halves ratio with Neptune's orbital period, which is why you see these two loops over a complete revolution in this, uh, in this um, uh, rotating frame. And uh, at aphelion, Pluto is, or Pluto's conjunctions with Neptune happen when Pluto is closer to its aphelion. And this is maintained, this phase relationship is maintained because of this orbital resonance. Now, it has also been known since the, uh, actually 1988 was this paper by uh, uh, Jerry Sussman and Jack Wisdom uh, when computers were just becoming powerful enough to be able to do very long integrations, very long propagations of uh, planetary orbits. And in this paper, they reported uh, the results of an 845 million year uh, orbit propagation of the entire solar system planets, including Pluto. And they found, they, they used this index called the Lyapunov index, where you take two initial conditions of Pluto and a shadow Pluto very close in space to where the first one, where the real Pluto is, and you follow how the, how the two orbits go. So it's your standard in physics, you do linear stability analysis, you take a tiny divergence from a tiny deviation from your initial conditions and ask, do the deviations grow exponentially when you get instability? If they grow linearly or uh, sublinearly, uh, you get, or, or they just oscillate, you get a, you have a stable solution. You have a stable point in phase space. So they found that nearby trajectories, uh, very close to Pluto, they diverge exponentially with, a, with an e-folding time of only about 20 million years. So this, this is an indicator that the orbit is chaotic. Uh, so that was the first, in fact, it was the first, uh, um, uh, first entity, first part of the solar system that was identified uh, to have uh, this chaotic nature. Uh, so chaos was, you know, chaotic dynamics had, had a very, very short history at that time. So, um, so chaos in the solar system, this was the first identification of chaos in the solar system. At the same time, there were other, other groups working on this. And this was this Italian group um, that had done also a comparably long, a hundred or hundred or 200 million year uh, propagation of the solar system, including Pluto. And they reported no, no uh, indication of chaos in Pluto's orbit. Uh, in fact, uh, I'll, I'll show in, in a moment. But they, they did find a new class of super resonances, that Pluto was engaged in, in a number of orbital resonances, uh, some higher order, uh, weaker resonances than that three to two resonance that I just showed you that it's engaged in with, uh, with Neptune. And uh, these super resonances, um, so they discovered these in here. And possibly they are related to this weak chaos that was discovered by uh, Sussman and Wisdom. Um, and then they, you know, so this became a somewhat of a um, controversial topic. What does it mean that Pluto is stable in one, one ex numerical experiment and chaotic in another uh, um, experiment? Um, so, so here they reported that the orbit of Pluto in an integration lasting 50 Lyapunov time. You know, this is 50 e-folding times you'd expect that any, any kind of instability would show up. It doesn't show up. There's no change in Pluto's orbital, uh, you know, overall orbital properties. Nothing much changes uh, over 50 Lyapunov times. And they introduced this idea called stable chaos, that this might be a common feature of solar system dynamics, where you do these numerical experiments, you get these positive Lyapunov exponents, you find uh, e-folding or uh, uh, exponential divergence. But in fact, there's no significant consequence, no, no real consequence of that. Um, this um, fast forward a few more years, 
we have a very long integration going plus minus five giga years now possible. This was in uh, 2002. This was by a Japanese group. Takashi Ito, by the way, is, is my co-author on the present uh, work that, that I'm going, the new results that I'm going to talk about. Um, so he, uh, this was part of his dissertation project back in 2002. He did this very long numerical propagation, plus, my, plus five giga years in the future, minus five giga years in the future, and found indeed, uh, you know, Pluto's orbit keeps doing what we see it doing today. It's, uh, it keeps the same shape, pretty much the same relative orientation. Um, it's, uh, its inclination wobbles a little bit, its eccentricity wobbles a little bit, but there's no crash, there's no instability. Okay? And uh, so, so that's, that's where we were, that Pluto's orbit is actually robust against uh, changes to its orbital parameters, okay? even though it has this um, exponentially uh, uh, growing divergence of nearby initial conditions. So now I, I, I'll, I'll uh, talk about what is the role of changes to the planet's parameters. All of these experiments were done changing Pluto's initial conditions, uh, but what is what happened? What is the role of the changes to the orbital parameters of the planets? So one one important role was uncovered some time ago. Um, this was in a couple of papers I wrote uh, 30 years ago, ago now, and that is understanding Pluto's uh, resonance with Neptune that uh, one could understand how its resonance came about if we allowed that Neptune hadn't formed where it is today at 30 AU. But going back in time, Neptune was closer to the sun and it had migrated outward, its orbit had migrated outward. If, if that had happened, then Pluto, Pluto-like objects that were in the in nearly coplanar, nearly circular orbits, um, somewhere outside Neptune's orbit, as Neptune migrated out, these such objects could have been picked up in these orbital resonances with Neptune, carried along, and part, part of that carrying along during that migration, their uh, orbital eccentricities would have been excited would, from zero, nearly zero initially, to what we find, what we can uh, look today. So Pluto's eccentricity today is about 25%. And uh, we could actually calculate based on Pluto's eccentricity, how, uh, how much Neptune would have to migrate, migrate and sweep it along in order to find uh, Pluto in a 25% eccentric orbit today. And the answer was that Pluto would have to migrate by about five astronomical units to account for Pluto's eccentricity in its resonant orbit. This is a lower limit because Pluto was picked up at some point in this resonance. Neptune might have been migrating much longer before, before picking up Pluto. So this gives us only the last, you know, since the time Pluto was picked up in that uh, resonance. Okay, this is a cheesy animation uh, on PowerPoint with that. Uh, but one important prediction was that uh, this kind of migration of the planet would uh, produce pile up, not only Pluto, but any small objects that were beyond P Neptune would be picked up in these resonances and there would be pile ups of these small objects at these particular resonant locations. So these are different resonances. There's a two to one resonance. There's a, another resonance of five to three in between. That's quite uh, um, uh, effective at capturing uh, objects into resonances when the resonances are migrating. And uh, then fast forward another, um, uh, you know, some, I think uh, about 10 years after this, there were enough Kuiper belt objects that had been discovered to notice that, in fact, there were pileups, that these Kuiper belt objects were piled up in these resonances, and they were in eccentric orbit. So this is eccentricity on the vertical axis, semi-major axis, or average distance from the sun uh, on the horizontal. Neptune is here. These are all of this is Kuiper belt objects. There are some something over, over 4,000 Kuiper belt objects are now known. And uh, there's a very strong pileup at the three to two, somewhat somewhat weaker, but uh, there's uh, observational selection effects as we go farther out. But there are pileups in these uh, resonances. And this, this made uh, <clears throat> the idea that Neptune had migrated, this became a, quite a convincing uh, piece of evidence that the planets had migrated in their history. And then going back to that math that, uh, that connects the eccentricity to how much Neptune migrated, by looking at the, the maximum inclination uh, eccentricities of these uh, plutinos, as they are now called, 
um, we can uh, find a, a, an even better lower limit to how much Neptune migrated, and that turns out to be about 10 astronomical units. Okay, so Neptune migrated by at least 10 astronomical units based on this idea that there was resonance sweeping going on. Um, so what fueled this migration? What caused the planets to migrate? It is what's called the planetesimal uh, driven migration. So once the planets had formed and reached their more or less um, current uh, masses, there was still a lot of uh, leftover planetesimal mass left in the solar system. So the solar system wasn't entirely cleared up like it is now. Uh, so four giga years or, uh, ago or so, all of these planetesimals were hanging around and the planets, actually their gravity, their gravitational perturbations cleared them out. Just like we do slingshots of gravity for uh, spacecraft when we have when we want to send a spacecraft farther out and in, into the solar system we do a gravity assist going by one or multiple planets so these planetesimals were cleared out doing for, with these gravity assists from the uh, from the perturbations from the planets and in that process there was exchange of energy and angular momentum and uh, the systematic uh, uh, effect is that these planetesimals uh, gave energy and angular momentum to this outer, the outer more, the outer planets, and uh, Jupiter being the heaviest planet and being the innermost one, uh, turns out does most of the heavy lifting of um, doing the ejection and clearing up of planetesimals, and so its orbit actually shrinks a tiny bit, and the other planets we think in these uh, in this kind of uh, uh, scattering model that the other planets' orbits uh, go outward, they migrate outward leaving behind a cleared region in between the planet's planetary orbits, but uh, some leftovers of the planet planetesimals remain beyond the last planet's uh, orbit, which is here, which is now we see as the surviving debris in the solar system, which is mainly the Kuiper belt. Okay, so, uh, you know, there are a number of quantitative uh, things have been done, many simulations of this actually here in Boulder, uh, over at Swari, there have been a, a people doing a, a lot of work on uh, figuring out the, some of the details of this uh, migration process, this planetesimal driven migration process. So we have some more sophisticated models of how the planets migrated, but there are still some unlocked, uh, un, uh, unsolved things. But there are more things, more evidence than just the, um, the Kuiper belt uh, that goes into um, believing that the planets actually migrated. So I'll just very quickly point you to these. So in the asteroid belt, even in the asteroid belt in the inner solar system, it turns out that there's an imprint of the migration, this inward migration of Jupiter, the outward migration of uh, Saturn. We can see that imprint in the distribution of asteroid orbits in the asteroid belt. There are asteroids that are missing where, um, they, where there ought to be asteroids if the planets hadn't migrated, they're not there. And we can explain it very, um, very readily with the specifics that we understand of Jupiter and Saturn's migration based only on the evidence from the Kuiper belt. Okay, so this is, this is like independent confirmation of that that we find. My, my grad student, Dave Minton, worked this out for his uh, dissertation. Um, and then there's the, uh, for a long time, actually, when the Apollo program went, went to the moon, the astronauts went to the moon and brought back tons of moon rocks. One of the scientific results, one of the major scientific results from the Apollo program was that was this concept, this idea that, uh, that, that was inferred from the analysis of the moon rocks that the, there had been an, a cataclysmic bombardment of the moon. Uh, it's called the late heavy bombardment that, that happened about 600 million years after the planets formed, after the 4.5 giga year timestamp that we have on the origin of the solar system. Um, uh, and uh, <clears throat> well after the, the lunar surface had so solidified, many hundreds of millions of years after, there had been a cataclysmic spike in the rate of bombardment on the moon. And this was linked to the, to the migration of the planets by uh, these authors. Uh, Go this was called the Nice model. It's part of the Nice model. Um, Gomez, uh, Rodney Gomez, Hal Levison over at Swari. They worked this out and linked the planet migration, the plan migration of Jupiter and Saturn to this late heavy bombardment. Uh, around the same time, uh, we were, I was working with a colleague at LPL, Bob Strom, who is, a, who is an expert on impact craters on planetary surfaces. And we found that there are these two different crater populations that are different in terms of their size distributions. 
and they're correlated with ages. So the old, there are old craters that have a different size distribution from the more recent craters. And this also speaks to uh, links to this uh, late heavy bombardment that the crater forming populations, the planetesimals changed in character uh, at some at, before and after this uh, cataclysmic bombardment of the moon. Uh, so there have been some revisions to these ideas. This is not the, you know, uh, back in 2005, the ideas we had there have evolved a little bit about the early bombardment history of the moon uh, and, and of the planets. This was not only on the moon, all of the terrestrial planets shared this. Mars, there's signs of the same kind of um, uh, two populations, two different crater populations on Mars as well as on Mercury, and uh, not on Earth and Venus, because Earth and Venus are geologically more active and they wiped out the old craters. Okay, so um, back to Pluto then. Uh, so this was about, you know, we have a lot of evidence that the planets migrated. Um, and I showed you the role that Pluto, Pluto played in, in, um, in getting to the idea that the planets migrated. Um, so we sent this uh, spacecraft, um, New Horizons, went through, went uh, to Pluto, went to the Kuiper Belt, and um, uh, we still don't understand the problem of, uh, you know, oh, of course, uh, New Horizons uh, brought up new puzzles about Pluto, that Pluto is geologically surprisingly active, uh, what's going on, so there are many more puzzles about Pluto, but I'm going to focus on this one problem of uh, Pluto's inclination. So we don't understand Pluto's inclination. Where does it come from? Uh, why is it as large as it is? And uh, some other aspects of it. Uh, so, the, so here's a very simple simulation of migration. Okay, take the planets, migrate them uh, by the amounts that we infer from, uh, from all the data we have from the Kuiper belt. And in the simulation, we start off with the coplanar. So this is eccentricity versus um, heliocentric distance or semi-major axis inclination versus a major axis. So we start off in the simulation with some nearly circular, nearly coplanar test particles. Let the planets migrate and uh, check where, the, where these test particles are at the end of that uh, migration. And uh, here, uh, actually at the end of that migration and then a giga year beyond that. And so actually four giga years beyond that, four or five giga years beyond that, five giga years. Yes, this was a simulation with five giga years. And at the end of five giga years, we have these things piled up in these resonances. Here's Pluto, this black, uh, the red dot is Pluto. And what you'll see is that the inclinations are also excited, but they kind of top out at about 10 or 12 degrees. Okay, there seems to be some barrier at 10 to 12 degrees. We can't kick up inclinations as high as Pluto's. The real uh, Kuiper Belt objects um, uh, have, uh, have inclinations as large as Pluto's, even somewhat larger, not in great numbers, they certainly fall off. The abundance of these high inclination objects uh, falls off, but not as much as, as you can see, this is basically zero objects we find in this uh, simple simulation. Uh, so these, uh, this, the, this resonance sweeping does not account, uh, it only accounts partially, you could say, for inclinations, uh, doesn't account for inclinations bigger than 10 to 12 degrees. Uh, more sophisticated models, so this was a very simple model. More sophisticated models also don't have very satisfactory solutions for the inclination distribution uh, in the Kuiper belt. Okay, so I um, so recently I went back to looking at uh, what else we could learn about this. So, um, so let's take a quick closer look at Pluto's inclination. And uh, this is again a top-down view uh, in the rotating frame. Uh, this is in, also in the rotating frame, but now a sideways view. So you're looking where you're, you're looking along the line from uh, Neptune to the Sun sideways, and you can see the up-down, the Z component of Pluto's motion. And what's interesting is that every time Pluto comes to perihelion, okay, there's perihelion, closest distance to the, to the Sun. It's above the plane of the solar system. Okay, so it's perihelion always occurs when it's above the plane of the solar system, not while it's passing through the plane of the solar system. And here's an animation, another side view. You can see that the perihelion occurs when it's above at positive Z near, and it's a maximum extent uh, above the plane of the solar system. Here's another way of uh, seeing those uh, librations that, that this, uh, the, uh, uh, this in the rotating frame, we saw that as a mutual libration relative to 
Neptune's uh, longitude. So that as a mutual libration, as a mutual uh, oscillation uh, is defined, uh, or it's uh, another way to characterize that is this angle called the resonant angle, which is a combination of the three, three and two times the longitudes of uh, uh, Pluto and Neptune and its uh, longitude of perihelion. And that angle phi uh, is uh, confined to, um, to oscillate around a mean value of 180 degrees plus minus about 90 degrees amplitude of oscillation. It has a period of 20,000 years, which is a little less than 10 times orbital period of uh, Pluto. So over about 10 orbital periods, uh, uh, Pluto does this azimuthal oscillation of its perihelion relative to where we saw Neptune is in that rotating frame. This other libration is very interesting. This is uh, the one that, uh, um, that the perihelion always occurs very close to uh, or above the plane of the solar system. And that's defined by, by an angle called the argument of perihelion. This is simply the angle that you take from the line of nodes of Pluto's orbit intersect, intersecting with the plane of the solar system and take the angle from that line of nodes to Pluto's perihelion. So this angle oscillates so every, and it oscillates around 90 degrees. Okay, so Pluto, when it's at perihelion, this angle is 90 degrees or close to 90 degrees, plus minus a few. And this has a longer libration period, four, four million years. And I like to show these uh, polar plots, which is eccentricity times sine and cosine of the argument of perihelion. And you'll, I'll be showing you these two plots uh, a number of times uh, as we go along. And in this, you can see that this is this oscillation um, of Pluto's argument of perihelion. And uh, uh, we've known for some time that there's a, there's a finite range over which uh, of the amplitudes of these oscillations where, the, where Pluto is stable. So for this one, uh, the azimuthal oscilla oscillation, uh, Pluto's amplitude is, uh, is uh, it's actually around 80 degrees. So it's a, the amplitude is 80 degrees, the half amplitude here. And the maximum amplitude that's stable is about 100 degrees. So Pluto is about you know, 20 degrees away from strong chaos. Outside of these boundaries, the orbits would be very strongly chaotic. So, you know, 20 degrees is some, some mod modestly good distance, so it's safe. Uh, for this one also, we have uh, uh, the libration amplitude for Pluto is, is not tiny. Uh, it's quite, mod it's, uh, it's substantial. And uh, the stable uh, oscillation lambda, uh, the stable range, the domain, uh, of stability here actually is uh, somewhat fuzzier. Depending upon other orbital conditions, it can be this, this narrow or it can be quite wide. And so it's, you know, it's modestly close to a uh, pretty strong chaos in these two parameters. Uh, this was a paper that Hal Levison and Alan Stern did um, uh, back in uh, 1995. And uh, they found, uh, they did this numerical experiments and found the, the places where, in terms of the light, latitudinal libration amplitudes and the azimuthal libration amplitudes, where were the orbits that were stable versus unstable? And you can see there's a, there's a sort of fractal structure here, somewhat. Uh, Pluto lies uh, here, and uh, it's some distance from the stable and unstable zones. Um, so they're, you know, it's not terribly far. So basically, the conclusion from this is that Pluto's orbit is robust to very small you know, those tiny um, uh, uh, initial conditions variations that were done in those numerical experiments by, by Jerry Sussman and Wisdom. Um, but it's not robust to moderate changes in its orbital parameters. So you change its libration amplitude by 10 or 20 degrees, you're closer to uh, strong chaos. Um, okay, so a um, little bit more. So these, uh, these azimuthal librations, as I mentioned already, are supported by Neptune's uh, resonant perturbation, so re the, this resonance with Neptune, and this is well understood. There's a well understood theory for capturing into this uh, orbital resonance and exciting the eccentricity, pumping up the eccentricity to these eccentricities that we see for Pluto and the Plutinos. But this other uh, libration is not well understood at all. It is, however, related to what's called, what I'm going to call the VZLK phenomenon. And uh, this is more commonly under, uh, referred to in the literature as the COSI resonance or the lead off COSI effect. And I'll walk us through it. I probably many of you don't know about it. 
this is a this is a, a, a this is a three body this is an effect in the three body problem and it's actually quite a quite a non intuitive and uh, surprising um, uh, effect in the three body problem and the migration and resonance capture only partially accounts for this for this uh, this resonance this phenomenon uh, as far as pluto goes okay, so this is a this is an unsolved problem i would say for pluto uh, so what is this resonance? So this is so VZLK. The LK refers to the K refers to Kozai. LK L is Lidov. Kozai Lidov was a was a, a Russian uh, mathematician. Kozai was a Japanese math mathematician, um, a planetary scientist actually, and they wrote papers in 1962, both of them, uh, describing this phenomenon uh, in the three-body problem, what's called the restricted three-body problem, and basically you take uh, uh, the sun. Um, a planet or a, a, a dominant central body, uh, a smaller um, perturbing body, a planet, and a test particle far away, or the other way, actually, they did it the other way. The test particle is orbiting the sun, the perturber is far away, and, uh, uh, and then the, uh, if the perturber's orbit plane and the test particle's orbit plane are not coplanar, uh, if, they're, if they have a non-coplanarity bigger than a certain critical value, then you can have this um, these latitudinal librations. So the two that test particle orbit can uh, oscillate like this. Do those uh, oscillations of that argument of perihelion, and during this oscillation, there's a coupling between the eccentricity and inclination. So the eccentricity and inclination uh, trade off with each other during this oscillation. Eccentricity gets bigger, inclination gets smaller, and the other way around. So this oscillation is of the plane of the orbit as well as of the ellipticity of the orbit, but it's only possible above some critical um, inclination. And this is a neat cartoon. This is uh, supposedly um, Mr. Lidov uh, dropping the moon on, on, on the Earth. So one of the effects of this phenomenon is that if you, that polar orbits are unstable. So inclinations, so if you take a test particle around the Earth, for example, an artificial satellite, put it on a polar orbit, under this, these, this three-body model. So Mr. Lidov showed that polar uh, artificial satellite orbits that are almost polar, in, uh, uh, so they're vertical, they're, they're going around the pole of the Earth, will be destabilized by perturbations by the moon or the sun. Okay, so that, this, is what, this, is, uh, this is what he discovered. Now, actually, there, there are some little uh, wrinkles to this. The Earth is oblate, and it can actually suppress that instability. But at the time, this is what they were doing, just the, the, the simple three-body problem with point masses. And uh, so a moon that would be, uh, if you were to put the moon on a polar orbit, it would just fall right, into, right on top of the Earth right away. So that's an instability. So this is another aspect of this. So this VZLK phenomenon actually has a very, very complex set of uh, aspects to it. One of them is this latitudinal oscillation. Another is this instability and so forth. Now there are two, uh, two types of these, right? So you can put the test particle close, close in. I think my uh, pointer died. Um, the, uh, so you can have, so what's called the inner problem where the perturber is uh, outside the, the perturbee. So the, pertur the, the test particle or your artificial satellite is close and the perturber is far away like the moon or the sun. Uh, or the outer problem where um, the, uh, the perturbi, the test particle is farther away and the planet is interior. So in this case, uh, in the inner problem, uh, like the artificial satellite problem being perturbed by the moon, the critical inclination you can see is, uh, tops out at about 40 degrees, it's 39.2 degrees. Okay, and uh, so as, you, uh, as a function of the semi-major axis ratio, how close so if, if the test bar, if, the, if your perturber is really far away, uh, you need something like a 40 degree inclination to have this oscillation happen and, and this instability happen. If, you're, uh, if, if, the, if you bring the two, if you bring your perturber or test particle closer to the planet or bring the perturber closer in, then the critical inclination gets smaller. For the outer problem, it's a little bit different. This is the case for Pluto. So Pluto is being perturbed by planets that are interior to its orbit. So Pluto is outside the, all the uh, orbits of the perturbers, potential perturbers. And so for, for this outer problem, the critical inclination is actually quite high. You can see that uh, for very large 
uh, discrepancy, uh, large, chain, large ratios of the same major axis. Uh, the critical inclination is 63 degrees, more than 63 degrees. As you bring them closer, uh, the critical inclination drops, but not by a lot. It drops to about 53 degrees, okay, as you bring them really close together. And also, it turns out there are two different uh, uh, possible um, points of uh, oscillation, stable points, centers of vibration. Um, and uh, Pluto has this 90 degree um, oscillation center for the latitudinal oscillations. But it's actually also possible to do oscillations around zero or 180 degrees where the, uh, where the perihelion would happen exactly in the plane, uh, in the plane of, uh, of the perturbator. Okay, so Pluto is this problem. And if you look at the ratio of uh, Pluto's semi major axis to Neptune, Neptune is the innermost and uh, the closest perturbator, then its critical inclination is about 57 degrees. Okay, so uh, the, as for this uh, VZLK theory for the three body problem. Uh, so Pluto's inclination is only 17 degrees. How is Pluto able to do this? Okay, so that's, that's the big pu puzzle. Okay, and there's, you know, we know through numerical simulations that it actually does this, but we don't know why. And, you know, only idle people like me like to answer the question, why? Why does this happen? Okay, what's, what's the kernel of what's making this happen? Um, so how does Pluto's VZLK oscillation come about? Neptune's perturbations, including its resonant perturbations, are not sufficient. So if you just do the three-body problem of Pluto, Neptune, Sun, you don't get this VZLK oscillation. Okay, so we went ahead recently doing these numerical experiments where we took subsets of uh, the inner three planets. So we think that you know, Jupiter, Saturn, and, Nept uh, and Uranus have some role in uh, this VZLK phenomenon for Pluto. And uh, so we did these, you know, we started with these very simple things, uh, take a subset of Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus, add them to the three body problem of the sun, Neptune, and Pluto, and uh, see if uh, uh, which planet, you know, our hope was maybe one of these planets is really crucial. Okay, so we did this, this is with all the planets. So you'll see these two, two figures with the uh, azimuthal vibrations, the phi, the resonant angle, and this polar plot of the um, argument of perihelion in E sine omega, E cosine omega. And if you do, and we propagated these for up to five giga years. And uh, with all four planets, of course, everything is hunky-dory. Uh, but with the subsets of these planets, not so. So on the right uh, over here um, uh, with this red box is the case of just Neptune and Pluto, the three-body problem for the sun, of course. And uh, you can see that uh, in the polar plot, so the resonant angle is librating fine, but uh, the argument of perihelion, this lower plot, that polar plot argument of perihelion is not librating. It's going all the way around the origin, which means that your arg that argument of perihelion is going through all zero to 360 values. Okay. Now, if you take this guy, we add, what, what did we do here? We added Uranus to the model. So now we have uh, Neptune, Pluto, plus another planet that's perturbing, that's Uranus. Well, things go really chaotic. Okay? You know, that, that Pluto, the, the li both librations, azimuthal and, um, uh, and the um, latitudinal librations are completely chaotic, totally unstable. So we, we introduced Uranus, the system, the, this three-body problem, all, all resonances got destroyed. Uh, we introduced Jupiter, and things are more stable, okay? They're kind of like the three-body problem, Neptune, Pluto, but uh, uh, we are not having, we are not getting that VZLK oscillation. So even uh, Jupiter is not able to do the uh, help with the, uh, completely give us that VZLK oscillation. So basically all, all subsets of, of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, uh, when we introduce them one by one or two planets at a time, or uh, it's, so, so the answer there was, well, first of all, Uranus turns out to be in all these numerical experiments, we concluded that if we add Uranus to other subsets also, Uranus is destabilizing on Pluto, whereas Jupiter is generally stabilizing. Okay? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't get Pluto into a chaotic orbit, but it doesn't give it the VZLK oscillation either. Um, but there's no subset, as I said, of uh, Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus that will do for Pluto's uh, libration, these uh, latitudinal librations over giga years. Uh, by the way, some of these uh, propagations didn't go as, as long as uh, five giga years. They, 
uh, Pluto disappeared, uh, got ejected out of the solar system in some of these uh, subsets. You can see in the case where we have Saturn, Uranus, where we added Saturn and Uranus, as well as when we had just Saturn, um, and also, of course, with just Uranus, uh, Pluto gets uh, ejected from the solar system. So uh, these sub so the solar system is, you know, it's sort of finely tuned. We've known that in some other ways as well. Uh, okay, so what is the answer for what is allowing Pluto to have this VZLK oscillation happen? Well, uh, these, uh, these numerical experiments, all they told us was that the subsets, uh, that we need all the planets. Okay, so then we went back a little bit, uh, took a step back, and we said, well, imagine Pluto over there. There's that, um, uh, the black dot. And uh, its orbit period is about 250 years. It takes 250 years to go around the sun. Jupiter goes around the sun in about, 10, in a, in about a decade, 11 years, 11 point some years. Uh, so from the point of view of Pluto, Pluto is moving around slowly, Jupiter is zipping around, right? Standard uh, thing in, um, in a planetary system. So Jupiter, Saturn uh, is also zipping around. Uranus, to some extent also, it has a pretty con large enough contrast uh, with uh, uh, Pluto's orbit. So we, we thought, okay, let's represent these inner planets as rings of mass. We kind of orbit average them, spread out their mass around, around their nearly circular orbits and represented uh, the, the role of all uh, four of the, all three of these planets, Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus as rings. And the reason, uh, the reason uh, it's, it's good to do that is because you can then, instead of having all these you know, multiple parameters for each planet, Jupiter is represented by its mass, its six orbital parameters, Saturn, as well as um, Uranus, we have a multi-parameter space to explore, to try to understand better what is their role on Pluto. Instead, with this, we can collapse it into one parameter, which is, so each of these planets ha acts like a ring of mass, and it provides a kind of quadrupole moment to the gravity in, uh, of the solar of the system that uh, that uh, uh, Pluto is moving in, and then we ask: uh, Is there a so so that one parameter is called the uh, quadrupole moment, the J two, the uh, gravitational harmonic of an oblate sun? So imagine putting rings or belts around the sun uh, around its uh, equator, uh, or equator being now the mean plane of the solar system. And so we think of, uh, so then we can do the simple model, which simpler model, which is a three, body a three body model. We have the Neptune, Pluto, and the sun, but the sun is oblate. Okay, so with this extra parameter, J2. And then we carried out experiments putting, uh, looking for J2 in this range from zero to 10,000. Okay, zero means no oblateness. 10,000 is a large, larger oblateness. Why are these numbers so large? Usually we think of uh, oblateness parameters as being tiny, you know, 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus four. Why is that uh, looking so large? I think I skipped over an equation for this maybe. Yeah, here's that equation. Uh, the effective uh, uh, J2 in the simple model has this ratio of the mass of the planet over the mass of the sun, which is a small, small number but it has the ratio of the orbit radius of the planet divided by the uh, radius of the sun, the physical radius of the sun. So that's a large parameter. Okay, so so uh, there's nothing, uh, nothing terrible about this. So this is, this is the range that's actually quite normal. It's still small because the gravity is gonna be very small. The gravity is gonna get multiplied by the ratio of uh, the orbit radius to that of the, um, the uh, Pluto out there. So uh, the actual oblate sun is not overwhelming the gravity of, of, of the sun itself. It's still a small parameter. Okay, so over this range, so these are different um, values ranging from up there, you see 100, and to the right, you see um, uh, 10,000 value of J2. And you can see that when J2 is very small, uh, we don't get the VZLK oscillation. We don't get those oscillations in that uh, 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 polar plot. Uh, and we don't get them when, uh, when J2 is very large, but there's some range, some middle range, there's some Goldilocks range where we get them. And uh, this is summarized here. So uh, there is in fact a, a range where uh, this VZLK oscillation occurs in this effective oblate sun model. And uh, that range is rather narrow. You can see uh, how little that is. And bordering that, so that's that green zone. Uh, so very small values of J2, 
the argument of perihelion for uh, Pluto will rotate and it would be stable, would not be chaotic. So it's just that it won't have this VZLK oscillation. And again, also for very large values. But in, in this narrow Goldilocks zone, um, uh, the VZLK oscillations will happen and they will be stable. But there's a range uh, around that, this orange zone and that red zone, the red zone is the boundary, which it's uh, slightly fuzzy, but all of that uh, orange zone and the red hash zone, um, the, uh, uh, if the J2, the effective J2 if, uh, is in that range, then um, Pluto's VCLK oscillations are strongly chaotic. Okay, so this Goldilocks zone is bounded by not stable orbits, but actually very strongly chaotic orbits. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, that. So we found that, um, I, I've told you all this. And so this range is uh, for this one parameter, it's 1350 to 1650. And what does that mean? So, okay, so main conclusion here is that there's a fortuitous, uh, that Jupiter, Saturn and Uranus, their effective J2 lies of course in that range. It's, uh, it's that blue line over there. That's, that's where the solar system lies. Um, so effectively, Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus create this quadrupole moment, which lies in that Goldilocks zone. Okay, so another way of saying that is that there's a fortuitous arrangement of Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus that supports Pluto's long-term stability. So that's our main result. Uh, beyond this, I'm just going to uh, tell you a couple. Of, so I haven't thought, through, thought, thought past this a whole lot. There are a couple of interesting implications. And I would invite people to think about, uh, you know, uh, uh, where else, uh, what else this implies. So it, basically, it implies that the solar system is finely tuned for Pluto, <laughs> to, to balance Pluto there. Okay, that's kind of a, a facetious way of saying it. But uh, what does this mean? So on the upper side, on the upper uh, boundary over there, the distance to um, to the chaotic boundary is is less than about 75 points let's say points in j2 and that implies that um, if you translate that into you know what room do you have what kind of different kind of solar system would still support pluto um, the room we have for differences for changes in the masses of the of these inner planets is about 20 less than 20 percent so jupiter uranus and saturn if you change their masses by about 20% or actually even somewhat less, this is, this is somewhat of, a, of an overestimate, um, you, the solar system would not support Pluto. And actually many other things would, would be different. Um, and the, the, the uh, room we have to play with is 10% in terms of the orbital radii. Okay, so, um, so the orbital parameters of these uh, giant planets um, are, uh, you know, that they're, they can't be much larger than that. So one thing that, that I find interesting uh, to think about is that in fact, you know, we, in exo, exoplanetary systems, we talk about uh, the architecture of uh, planetary systems. What does that mean? Okay, it's, a, it's a rather fuzzy concept. But there may be a way to actually quantify that in terms of this one parameter, the overall quadrupole moment. And maybe we can go a little beyond that, look at J3, J4. And that might be a way to quantify that concept of uh, architecture of a planetary system. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm uh, on, a, um, on my nearly last slide here. Uh, how would J2 be um, uh, this uh, value of J2 from, the, from these planets? How would this, ha this have changed while the, when the planets migrated? So when the planets were in these closer in orbits, they were more scrunched up together. J2 would have been smaller. How much smaller? We don't actually know. We don't have very strong constraints. We have a constraint on how much Neptune migrated, somewhat of a constraint on how much Jupiter migrated, although many models uh, flout that constraint. Uh, there, there are ideas that Jupiter might have migrated from you know, 50 AU into where it is now. And these are inspired by uh, the discovery of exoplanets with uh, uh, very short orbits for Jupiter, Jupiter mass planets. Some of these are inspired by that. Um, so, uh, so we don't have good constraints on how much the other planets, except for Neptune, migrated. Okay. Um, so if you take some very modest, you know, five to 10% migration for Jupiter and Saturn, then we can, uh, if we fix that, then uh, uh, Uranus, we can pull out uh, actually some constraint or not constraint maybe, 
but some 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 insight into um, how much uh, Uranus might migrate. So if Uranus migrated by more than five AU, five astronomical units, then this uh, 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 the J two value for for the for the solar system would have gone would have transited from unstable to stable VZLK orbits uh, uh, for Pluto like orbits. Okay, so. Um, and I'm thinking that maybe that's the clue to getting to understanding how Pluto's inclination can be excited. What happens during that transition? Okay, we can we can uh, investigate that further. I don't have the answer, um, so I'll just summarize. Uh, it is uh, that in trying to understand the problem of Pluto's inclination, we stumble upon this kind of new insight that there is a fortuitous orbital arrangement of Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus which defines a narrow zone of long-term stability for Pluto-like orbits. The zone is bounded by very strongly chaotic orbits. And the problem of Pluto's inclination still remains somewhat puzzling. Thank you. Um, thanks, thanks very much. Do we have any questions in the room? Oh yeah. Okay. So the question is, uh, how big is uh, the J2 effect for the Kuiper belt as a whole? So it's actually very similar to what it is for Pluto. Um, so it causes uh, what is the what is its actual functional uh, effect? It changes the rates at which um, um, the the orbits precess. Okay. So the lines of nodes precess at different rates. And uh, the la the uh, longitude, the perihelion precess at different rates. So they are all, you know, uh, within within the the range that allows Pluto's oscillations. Uh, the actual rate of um, or the effect of J two is actually very similar to all other Kuiper belt objects. I hope that answers your question in terms of magnitudes. Okay, whether it actually makes uh, for these VZLK oscillations for other Kuiper belt objects, not so because uh, uh, these resonances uh, uh, are particularly sensitive to, um, to this J2 effect. And uh, there, are, there are other, there's a subset of Plutinos that are, that are confined to doing this VZLK as well, just like Pluto is, but other Plutinos are not. So it's a narrow range in which um, uh, this, uh, this J2 allows this VZLK to happen. Okay. Um, all right. On your um, so I'll repeat the the questions as best as I can. The first question is. Um, uh, is it a coincidence that uh, the Pluto satellite system is nearly face on to its um, line of sight to or, or its, ra its radial position vector from the sun? And, uh, you know, I haven't uh, actually looked uh, at the dynamics of that. I imagine that it uh, precesses and doesn't always remain in that uh, location, but I don't know the answer to that. So maybe somebody's looked at that. Uh, your second question was. Um, about um, uh, craters or oh, that was the third question the that was the third question maybe so let me answer that one first uh, is there any indication of uh, 
planet migration in the crater record on Pluto. Okay, so I think your colleague, uh, Kelsey Singer, is the expert on that. Uh, I have not seen her talk about uh, these two different uh, crater size distributions that we find on the moon and the other terrestrial planets. We also find them incidentally on, on Ceres and uh, uh, a couple, I'm thinking there's some other objects. Um, I don't know that she's actually looked at uh, whether there are craters of different size distributions to be found on, uh, on Pluto. I suspect not. I think the crater record there is quite sparse. Much of the surface of Pluto is taken up by uh, a very fresh surface. So all craters have been wiped out, but not all. I think uh, uh, she, I, I understand that she gets, uh, gets an approximate age of the surface still of uh, four giga years. So my guess is that the data there is kind of on the, on not sufficient to be able to see two different crater size distributions. Okay. And uh, remind me of your second question. Ah, okay. Right. So I think there the simple the simple criterion there is uh, they must they have to be in the hill sphere effectively of uh, Pluto Charon, and the hill sphere would change uh, as Pluto migrated, uh, but I think they are quite well inside uh, the hill sphere that uh, even. If, when Pluto started out before it was captured in this resonance, the hill sphere would have been smaller, but only about maybe 30% smaller. And I think they're still pretty far from that 30% boundary. Okay, thank you. Ah, so um, uh, other large planets could, of course, affect uh, this effective J2, but larger planets are actually, uh, or farther planets are actually quite weak at tweaking the J2. And so for all, you know, if you're thinking about planet nine, uh, uh, Alan, planet nine, as it's uh, currently advertised, is a few hundred astronomical units away. And a planet uh, of even uh, you know many uh, many 10, uh, 10 Earth masses at that distance uh, would barely affect uh, this J two value uh, would barely affect uh, Pluto's dynamics, uh, but it could affect other uh, uh, similar VZLK oscillations that have been observed in other resonances, more distant resonances. So it is it is potentially uh, of interest, I would say, to be able to find possibly find limits or um, tests of planet nine through looking for, um, by looking for um, the stability of um, uh, orbits in other resonances farther out. Oh, mm -hmm. this range is very specific to Pluto, but uh, uh, the the broader uh, point that I was making was that what do we mean by the architecture of a planetary system? And I think we can use this approximation uh, where we can uh, uh, add, we can collapse the parameters of many planets into a few fewer plan fewer parameters like J two, J three for example could measure. Um, uh, non coplanarity of the of a planetary system, uh, J3, yes, J3, and so forth. You know, maybe you can go up to J2. If you go too, too far beyond that, it's, then it's useless because then you're back to having too many parameters. So uh, having two or three parameters to describe the uh, architecture of a planetary system would be useful, would be quantitative. My question is for some systems are only uh -huh. Would there be uh, 
Ah, okay. I see. Could you? Uh, I see. Okay. So yeah. So you know this particular Goldilocks range of J two uh, supports a, a certain architecture for Kuiper belt objects. You know, for the Plutinos, for example. Um, so you'd have to find subset some subsystems like that to um, to make statements like you know this is the range where this kind of uh, 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 subsystem can exist or not exist. Yeah. I hope that. Ends. know about the architecture of the planetary systems, what do you think the probability is that planets have already been ejected? Likely or unlikely? Um, so I, I think it's likely, that's, uh, but it's an opinion. Uh, do we have evidence for that? Um, I haven't seen that spelled out very concretely. There is a uh, some hand waving argument that the entire you know this inclination problem might be because of planets that have been been ejected that they had they were temporarily in the solar system and scattered these small bodies around and had a strong effect on uh, exciting the inclination so that's a sort of loose evidence for ejected planets 